I've titled this sermon, Are You a Disciple? And it's based on the Sabbath text, which I read earlier, and I, and I will now repeat from Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, absor all, to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. May I ask, have you come to a place in your heart where you know that it's not so much about what you want, in terms of what you exhibit or what you show to the world, it's who you are. You exhibit or reflect what you've become as a human being. So this sermon is about showing you how to achieve the highest level of consciousness that you can achieve. That is to be aligned with God or aligned with his word. And when you are, you become a disciple yourself. So I'd like to start with a poetic offering from Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Listen to the words and ask yourself if they really mean something to be true for you. If you really believe what the poet's analogy is offering here. He says, what if you slept? And what if in your sleep you dreamed? And what if in your dream you went to a beautiful place? And there picked a strange and wonderful flower. And what if when you awoke, you held that flower in your hand? Ah, ah, what then, I ask? Do you believe that it's possible to bring something from this world that you learnt in Sabbath lesson from the world into the afterlife? The poet was speaking metaphorically. But I am not. Because when you awake from our earthly sleep, sleep, the truth that we preach as Adventists will be a reality. The thoughts we have about the heaven will come alive. There will be the prophets of old. There is Elijah. There is Paul. What we've read about in our Bibles will be there for us to see. So you see, this is really a sermon about applying those words from the Bible into your own reality. Most of us were brought up to become ordinary. And I'm certainly not decrying ordinary, but ordinary is just not good enough for the member of the remnant church. Ordinary is you go through your life sitting in the same church pew week after week, all through your life, and you just fill it out and you do what Ma and Pa taught you. And you're honorable and honest and you're a good citizen and a church member. And then you die. Being a disciple is something quite different. This is about recognizing within yourself that there's something very, very special that you've been taught to believe in. You, you as a remnant church member, have come to a place where you can apply it and put it into your life. But more than that, you can go way beyond ordinary, beyond the dream that I just mentioned. You can go way beyond being just average. Yet, there's not an average person in front of me right now. All of us are extraordinary. We just believe what the word says. But to be a disciple, what you do is listen to that gentle whisper, that still small voice, God's voice, that quiet voice that speaks to your very soul. That was my introduction. But what do those words mean in the here and now? 
How do they relate to the sermon, the sermon title, which is, Are You a Disciple? How can we be sure that when we wake from the sleep of death, which I was sort of trying to describe with the poem, and find the reality of what we've been taught in this tabernacle here on earth? Will we awake to that reality? Yet I'm sure we'd all agree that a Christian is defined as one who follows Jesus. But not all, all who call themselves Christians are true disciples. So what I would like to discuss this morning is what it costs, what it costs to be devoted to Christ. Or to take it further, what it costs to be a true disciple. Well, obviously, all disciples are believers. But not all believers are disciples. So as Adventists and claimants to the truth, we need to be careful not to be long on one thing and short on something else. Let me put it another way. Are we long on membership and short on discipleship? Lots of emphasis on the detail, but not much emphasis on the growing. Yet again, according to the New Testament, if a church is doing what it ought to be doing, it ought to be discipling God's people. So most of us, when we think about disciples, our mind naturally rests on the twelve apostles as disciples. Yet Jesus intended that all of us who call ourselves Christians would be disciples. That's reasonable to assume, is it not? With that statement, I place specific emphasis on those who claim to be members of the remnant church. We're very good at saying that, you know, in this church. We are the remnant church. We're the last day church. We're the special church. We're very good at saying that. And I make the reasonable assumption that a member of the remnant church would be a disciple. Otherwise we're not really very true to what we're being taught here. I motivate that statement with the words of Jesus in Matthew 28, which I read earlier, and I repeat, Go therefore and make disciples to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then he said in verse 20, Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. Okay. All right. Let me ask every one of you, I'm going to challenge you now, whose life is being changed because of who you are? I'll repeat that question. Whose life is being changed because of who you are? He says, go therefore, which is what I've just read from my Sabbath text, go therefore, as you go about your daily life, make disciples. I would understand those words to mean that our lifestyle should be such that it would challenge other people that they too would become learner disciples. Otherwise they're not really worth very much. Now what is it that makes someone else to become a learner disciple? So I suggest, look at your life. Let me look at my life. What motivates other people to start feeling a hunger in their hearts for God? Something that goes on in their life, something about our testimony, about something that God is doing in our life. Is our testimony good enough that we excite people and encourage other people to believe in the word of God, which is the truth? You see, a success as, as a Christian isn't just that I stay out of sin. Success in my life is glorifying the living God to the point that it's making a definite and determined difference in someone else's life. I didn't say that's at all easy. In many cases, the challenge may be that in practice, it may be very, very difficult. So let's have a look at Luke 14, verses 25 and 26. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now notice how many times that phrase is mentioned in this passage of scripture. Cannot be my disciple. And from verse 27, And whosoever does not carry their cross and follow me, 
cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Well, suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming out against him with 20,000? Then verse 32, if he's not able, he will send a delegation while the others is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? I mean, that applies to us, isn't it? If we lose the truth, what are we worth? But I just remind you here that when Jesus was saying that, in Bible times there were some types of salt that could lose their savour. It's neither fit for the soil nor for the manure pile. It's thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So that's a warning about being the useless Christian. That was Jesus' way of saying, listen up, guys. So having said that, my question then is, what is the real price of discipleship? Well, I can tell you what it isn't, by the way. Before we start what it is, I can tell you what it isn't. It's not accepting Jesus Christ as your personal saviour, being baptised, joining the SDA church, having a presumptuous attitude, and becoming a connoisseur of good sermons from your chosen pew. That is not the price of discipleship. So let's have a look again at the word, beginning from verse 26. It says, here is the first cost price for the disciple. By allowing Jesus to live in and through him, he says, this is the first price you have to pay. Then from verse 26, if anyone comes to me and says, they don't hate their father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, count him out. Such a person cannot be my disciple. What did he mean when he said, does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters? Surely, surely, my friends, as a reasonable person, I find that statement very difficult to swallow. Well, let me tell you what the word means. Then let me explain what he says here. The word he uses here, does not hate. It actually means to love less. Actually, C.S. Lewis claims that the opposite to pride, to love, is pride. It is not hate. I'm told, if you go back into the Old Testament of the Hebrew and trace the use of the word and how it's used, it means to love less. So what he's saying here is this, as anyone does not love less his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, in his own approach, unless he loves them less than he does me, he cannot be my disciple. Now to sum up, here's what he's saying. The love that's within us must be so strong towards the Lord. A loyalty and devotion and love to Jesus Christ must supersede our love for anyone and everyone else. In other words, even to the point that in our obedience to the Lord Jesus and thinking of those who we love and those who love us, sadly, we do not care that we're not concerned that we do not love them as much as we ought. So, to that degree, there is a level of pain that can develop in our obedience to Jesus Christ. In the Christ-like love, nowhere does it imply that it is simple or easy, or even all of your Christian friends and family will agree with you. Now he says, except a man love less than those whom God has given him to love. And all this devotion and loyalty towards the, the Lord Jesus Christ exceeds his love for all others. Even to the point that he or she is totally misunderstood and may be criticized and persecuted by their own family. 
He says, you cannot be a true follower of Christ. Now here's the problem. We live in such an affluent world and too many churches today are such, I don't mean the STA actually, but generally, and too many churches today are a weak, degenerated church body. That the discipleship is totally left, left out of our thinking and teaching because it just doesn't fit. But what we have to do is to get back to God and ask ourselves the question, did Jesus mean what he said? Did Jesus mean what he said? I mean, this is what Brother Nimrod was saying the, this morning in, in the lesson, that these facts are emphatic. The word is emphatic. The rules are emphatic. God, Jesus, means what he says. I don't have any evidence anywhere in the Bible that Jesus meant anything except this, that my love and devotion and obedience to Jesus Christ must supersede my love and devotion and obedience to all of us, even to the point of being misunderstood, even if it's painful in the process of doing so. But then there's a second price tag. Remember, we're talking about the cost of being a disciple now. I'll remind you about that. So there's a second price tag here. Listen to this. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That is, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, how many times we've said this? Christ is crucified, and Paul said, I too was crucified with him. I'm crucified with Christ. Taking up the cross means that I choose death to the self-life. That is, I've chosen death to the flesh life. It does not mean that I will never participate in it. It means that as a way of life and lifestyle, I've chosen death to the old way. And I'm sure all of you must agree with that, because when you became baptized, you accepted Jesus in your life. You accepted or agreed that death to the old way. You don't live the old lifestyle anymore. He says that the cost of li uh, discipleship, what does not carry... He says that is the cost of discipleship. Whosoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, and what those me words mean is attached himself to me. Let me ask you a question. Can I ask you a question? Every one of you. Every one of you. What are you attached to? See, one of the biggest things that needs to happen in the body of Christ is there needs to be a detachment from things. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we sink very light roots to things because the truth is it must at all times be available to do what he says. When he says it, where he says it, at any moment, whatever his choice is. You see, maybe now you see this is Satan's cloak. Many churches today are working to get acceptance by the world. And I'm not mentioning churches, any church specifically, but they want to be accepted by the world. Please, Lord, may God deliver us from acceptance by the world. Did you know, did you know that the worst thing that could happen to the Seventh-day Adventist church is for the unbelievers to say, well, I'll tell you what, let's stop criticizing the church. Let's accept them. Listen, I'll tell you what would happen, friend. There would be a total collapse. We don't want to be accepted by them. We want them to accept our Christ and his truths. Because that's what we teach in this church. It's the truth. Am I right? Do we agree? That's what we desire. That's what discipleship is all about. Now, in the middle of this, Jesus drops in this little parable. He says, now, for, the, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it. All who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. What is he saying? He says, listen. Listen up. It's not easy to be a follower of Jesus. 
that is a true committed follower of Christ, a member of the remnant church, which is what we are all claimants to here, because that's what we claim to be. So he says, therefore, before you leap, he says, look really good. Be sure you understand what it means to be a follower of Christ. Not just your name on the membership list of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Then he says, what king, when he sets out to meet the, the another king in battle, does not first sit down and decide about two things? Well, he's got 10,000 soldiers versus 20,000. Is he going to attack or is he going to be clever and goes to negotiate peace terms? Then look at the next text verse. So therefore, no one of you, three times he says it, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Aha! Aha! I was waiting for that one. He says, now who doesn't give up all his own possessions? Now we can rationalize this one. We can reason this one out. We can say anything you want to say about that. But that's exactly what it means. There must come a time in your life when you say, God, it's all yours. You do with it what you choose. Because God is the one who's given you what you have. The question is, not much how much do you have, but how much of you does God have? Now, my friends, when you accepted Christ into your heart, you became a Christian and you were baptized, you took a decision to follow Christ, and that would mean God has all of you. I trust that is the case. Did you know that God isn't interested in the things in your life? He knows they're not yours to begin with. And you know they're not yours. And he knows that he has access to any and all of it, any split second in your life. We must learn to live with things, yet be above and detached. That's the only time you'll be free. I hope you're catching what I'm trying to say here. Freedom is the greatest treasure in life when you can live amidst and among things in the world, yet you are freed and liberated. You're not attached. Nothing is attached to you, but you're walking in the freedom and the liberty of Jesus Christ. Then it doesn't make any difference. And you see, what he, when he says, unless a person who does not give up all his possessions. Now, for the rich young ruler, he said, I want you to sell everything you have. We all know that story. Then he said, give it to the poor and come after me. Now, you just think for a moment. He meant exactly what he said. He doesn't require everybody to give up everything they have. That is, sell every single possession if they haven't followed Jesus. He doesn't require that of everybody. But if he doesn't, let me ask you a question. If he doesn't require that of you, how many of you would be willing to do it? Perhaps once in a while, we should bring that to mind. So, okay, God, at this point in my life, is there anything to which I'm attached? Is there anything that has an attachment upon me? He said to the rich young ruler, you sell it all and come and follow me. Think about that for a moment. By a foolish mistake, he held on to his attachments and gave up following Christ. What a foolish move on his part. My friends, anything that you're attached to, anything that has an attachment to you, anything that you've not given to him, anything that he doesn't have ready access to, is cheating you out of God's best in your life. You see, the same thing is true in relationships. We can have no attachments that are not of God. No attachments to things or to people that are not of God. Let me ask you, what are you attached to? Think about it for a moment. What are you attached to? I'm talking about the things you and I know about that people get to attached to naturally. You ought to be attached to your wife. 
and your sons and daughters and your husband. That's a divine attachment that God gave. That's a love relationship. What I'm talking about here are things or relationships which can pull against the divine relationship that is between you and God. What is it that has an attachment upon you that you wouldn't be willing to give up? Let me ask you a question. Are you living in it? Are you driving it? Are you wearing it? Do you have a relationship with it? Do you own it? Does it own you? The Christian life is a life of liberty and freedom, not just to rejoice in the Lord, but liberated from the attachments of life. What he says is, no one is my disciple unless we are willing to lay it down before him. Become detached. Be sure his name's on the will, his name's on the bond. Everything you and I supposedly own is all his. He's free to take it any time he chooses. Or give it back multiplied if he chooses. And here's the wonderful thing about God. Friend, the more you become detached, you know what happens. I said, as long as you stay detached, God is able to trust you with more, to give more to enjoy in life. On the other hand, that may not be true. It just depends on what God's perfect plan is for your life. Either way, you must accept it as God's will. Remember, the key to detachment is not ownership. Detachment. Then listen to what he said, therefore. Salt is good. But if salt has become tasteless, what good is it? And what he's simply saying in the last two verses is this. Really, what good are we to the kingdom of God if we're not going to be true, de true followers of him? What good are we? We're salt without taste. It's just completely waste. Here's what happens. It's all wrapped up in one word. In that word, my sermon title, Are You a Disciple? Garibaldi was an Italian revolutionist, really, and probably one of the most recognized guerrilla fighters in modern times. But this is back in the 1800s. And in his desire to unify and liberate Italy, he set out to do that. And one day, he was walking along, and he saw these fellows on the street corner and asked one of them to follow him. And they said to him, what do you offer? And this is what Garibaldi said. I offer you hardship, hunger, privations innumerable, rags, sleepless nights, foot sores and long marches, and victory in the noblest cause that ever asked you. What does Jesus Christ offer us? My friend, the first thing he offers is a cross. And most folks want to duck that one and just go into the kingdom and then rejoice in the blessings. Friend, this remnant church life is tough. I'm talking about the remnant church now, the chosen ones that we, we believe that we are. It's tough now. It's going to be tough, and it's going to get tougher. At least in this country, it's going to be more and more difficult for more and more of God's people to live separate and keep the, cro keep the cross. Not in the background of their mind, but in the forefront of their thinking. It's that that they've learned to live detached from the world and attached to him. So we've just listened to the word. And perhaps, perhaps we understood it. But who has heard it aright? Jesus does not allow us to leave this church in a few minutes, go home, then pick and choose whatever parts we find helpful and testing them to see if they work. He doesn't give us a frame, free reign to misuse his word with our earthly minds. But he gives the word to us on condition that we submit ourselves to its exclusive power. As humans, we could probably understand and interpret God's holy word in many different ways. Yet Jesus knows only one possibility, simply by doing and obeying it. It's that simple. I'll repeat a story 
I didn't intend to do this, but I repeat a story when I got hold of Richard Verenbrandt because he came here three times, first time in 1972, and I read all his books, and I got hold of him in the town hall. He was by himself then. It was quiet. And I told him I'd read all his books because I thought I was clever and cocky and a little bit wise, you know. And that poor man had been in jail for 14 years, seven years in solitary confinement. And he just looked at me, and he said to me, what did you do about it? And he turned around and he walked off. And it took me 30 years before I could admit that. I was so ashamed. What did you do about it? In other words, not to discuss it as an ideal. He really means that we should get on with it. Yet as believers, we long to hear him say to us in the judgment, in the judgment day, which is going to come because this is what we learned about in the Sabbath lesson this morning. I would love to hear the words, George Ross, I have known thee. I would love to hear those words. I long to hear them. Yet, it sets us at once to work. And obedience is the rock on which we build our house. There's only one proper response to his word, which Jesus brings to us from eternity, and that is simply to do it. Jesus has spoken. Jesus, the Son of God, has spoken. His is the word, but ours is the obedience. Only in the doing of the word does Jesus retain his honor, power, and might among us. Only in the doing of his word. There's only one other possibility. Only one other possibility. <laughs> and that is a failing to do it. It's impossible to want to do it and yet not do it. To deal with the word of Jesus other than by doing it is to deny the three angels' message and say no to his word. If we start asking questions, posing problems and offering interpretations, we are not disciples. Once again, the shades of the rich man I mentioned earlier are raising their heads. However loudly we assert our faith and claim to be members of this remnant church, Jesus still calls it not doing. Because the word which we fail to do is no rock to build a house on. There can be no union with Jesus. He's never known us. Let me explain. That is why when the storms and troubles come, we lose the word. And we find we never really believed it. The word we had was not Christ's but a word we'd pulled from him and made our own by reflecting on it instead of doing it. Listen to this one. The number one regret that people have when they know they are dying. The top regret is, I wish I had the courage to live the life I knew I was destined to, to live. I had a purpose. I knew there was something greater that I came here to do other than just going along and following somebody else's ideas. Most of us don't allow ourselves to listen to those internal callings which God calls the still small voice. William Blake, the famous writer, said man has closed himself up till he sees things through the narrow chinks of his cavern. Aldous Huxley, another famous writer, wrote an essay called The Doors of Perception. There are things that are known, and there are things that are unknown. And in between are the doors. And even Jesus said in John 10 verse 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enters in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. That door is God's word. And you can open it yourself and discover so many new things. So I ask myself, what is your purpose? What do you want to do? 
Don't you want to understand God's words, God's realization in your life? That it becomes the real thing? Live, live from that place and where I'm going, doing God's will and when I'm doing God's will and I know it. Again, you must go to that silence. That silence is a place that cannot be divided. Silence is the only place where you can hear the still small voice. You remember Elijah that we've spoken about earlier. When you hear that voice, you realize that the laws of the material world, those attachments I mentioned earlier, do not apply at all in the presence of the Almighty God. Sadly, the majority of folk are not living life as it was intended. Many live under the delusion that they're mere human beings living in a material world. But get real folk. And they only hope to escape it when you die. And maybe, if you get lucky, go to heaven. Remember, you are not the body that you are, uh, that you are living in. That returns to dust. The body that lives for a short while. Three score and ten. And I've gone past that already by seven years. So my time is going. So a house crashes in ruins because it was not founded on the word of Christ. So as I close, God's language is clear enough. This word is clear enough. This whole message is staggering in its simplicity and clarity. Yet it is not for this preacher to decide who will hear and who will not. Yet the proclamation is clear and concise in Matthew 25 verse 6. And this is, this can be a bit scary unless your heart is right with the Lord. Matthew 25 verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go out to meet him. My brother, my sister, the kingdom of God has drawn nigh. Have you heeded his call to discipleship? Amen.